Drill noises, drill noises, drill noises. I spared every expense on the special effects in this week's episode. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to make a Chuck key. Now, this is not a video about making a Chuck key because the Internet doesn't need any more videos about making Chuck keys. Instead, I'm going to use this little project as kind of a pedagogical framework to discuss order of operations. Now, order of operations is very much down to experience, probably more than anything else in the machine shop, but there are some rules of thumb and tips and guidelines that'll help you on your journey. So let's go. Here's the chuck key that came with my lathe, and it's, well, functional, but after several years, it's really giving up the ghost. The Tommy bar doesn't stay in place anymore, and it's got this spring-loaded safety feature on it that just gets stuck and renders the thing unusable, and yeah, the whole thing is trash. So I've got some material here to make a new one. I've got some nice 01 tool steel and a piece of 1144 stress proof for the handle. So I think that'll be a nice combination. These parts are a little bit thicker than the originals, which is a feature. I'd like the new chuck wrench to have a little more meat on it, a little more funk in that trunk, if you will. This design is inspired by this chuck key for my four jaw, which was made for me by my friend James over at Cloud42. You should go check out his channel, of course. Now, mine will not be monogrammed like the one he made, so my three jaw chuck key will be plain backed like I'm some kind of chump. You want to be thinking about your order of operations long before you even touch the stock. I'm going to start here by facing off the end, as is tradition, as I always joke, but in fact, it's not just tradition. This is your first order of operations decision. This facing cut is typically your first reference surface on a part in the lathe, and reference surfaces that you have access to dictate a lot about what order you do various cuts in. Furthermore, where you position this part in the jaws matters because once you've committed to a jaw position in a three jaw chuck, as you see here, in order to maintain concentricity, you may have to leave it in this position. So you may need the stock pulled further out than this, for example, if you have subsequent features that need to be square to this facing cut. On this part, because it's just a chuck key, I'm not worrying about concentricity at all, but concentricity is one of the primary drivers for order of operations decisions. You need to be thinking about which features need to be done in the same setup to ensure maximum concentricity between those features, and you need to be thinking about what types of chucks or other work holding you're going to need to maintain concentricity between setups if you have features between setups that have to be concentric. Another key driver of order of operations decisions is work holding. What you see me doing here is turning down the diameter at the end of this stock. That's in preparation for putting the square end on the end of the chuck key. You might be wondering why I'm doing that now when I haven't turned down the body of the chuck key at all yet. The reason that I'm doing this is because I want a taper near the square end of that chuck key like you saw on James's chuck key. But as soon as there's a taper on it, it's going to be very difficult to hold it in the mill as you see here. So what I've done is just turned down that area to make it easier to cut the square end, but nothing is tapered yet so it's easy to hold it in the mill. Now again, I've given up my concentricity in the three jaw chuck by doing this. So if this was a spinning shaft in a transmission or something where concentricity of all these features was critical, you might choose a different order of operations. For these square features, I'm choosing to side mill them rather than end mill them because that will leave a nice fillet at the base of each of the square sides. That looks nice, but it's also good for strength. You don't get stress risers in a fillet as you would if there was a square shoulder in there. Which brings us to another category of order of operations decisions, which is how you're going to be doing your cuts. Many features, for example slots, can be cut either side milling or end milling. And which you do might depend on how easy the part is to fixture in a particular position, or whether the slot requires a rounded or square bottom, and so on. You may have also noticed that I'm doing all the side milling only on the front of the part. In principle, you could do both front and back at once and do all four sides in two setups. However, that would require climb milling on the back, and I only want to do conventional milling in this because it's tool steel and I have small machines. So the type of milling that you're going to need to do and the material affect your order of operations choices. If this was brass, I might be happier cutting front and back at the same time, but depending on which sides you're milling on and what direction you need to move the cutter, that might affect, for example, where in that call-up block I put the stock, or how much clearance I needed to machine at the end of the square features. If I had subsequent operations, for example a cross hole, 
that needed to be very square to this square feature, I might not be able to use a call-up block, and so that would alter my order of operations again. You also want to be thinking about how you're going to measure each of the features that you're creating. That can affect order of operations. In this situation, the only dimension that matters is the size of that square end there, and I want to make sure that that's a good fit in the chuck. Use of a call-up block here allows me to test fit the part in the chuck, and if I needed to make adjustments, I could go put it back in the mill because that setup was repeatable. I'm going to put it back in the lathe now and cut the taper. Now once again, I've given up concentricity here, and I'm not going to get it back by using the three jaw again like you see here. But again, this is a chuck key, so it doesn't matter. Knowing where concentricity matters and where it doesn't not only affects your order of operations decisions, but your efficiency as well. When you're first learning, it's constructive to strive for maximum concentricity everywhere, but that's also very time consuming. So once you've learned the rules, then you can learn when it's okay to break them. I'm putting a center in this now for tail support for the taper turning, but again, that was an order of operations decision. Depending on your requirements, it might have made more sense to do that center earlier. And then once again, the stock's position in the three jaw while I was cutting that center was an order of operations decision because I decided that concentricity was less important here than rigidity, and I didn't want to have to set up the steady wrist in order to get both. As I'm cutting this taper, you can see that order of operations also affects design decisions. This taper angle here is limited by the position of the stock in the chuck because I chose to cut that square end first and do the taper facing outward as you see here, which means that because of the proximity to the chuck, I can't get the compound rotated any further over. I actually would have preferred a little bit of a lower angle here on this feature, but that would have required a different order of operations because I would have needed to be holding the other end of this part in the chuck so that I can turn this taper facing the other way. Or conversely, you could start with a much larger piece of stock sticking much further out of the chuck to give you clearance, and then once again set up the steady rest. Now I'm ready to part the body of the chuck key off here, and of course when to part is a crucial order of operations decision for any part. Once you part it off, you've lost the ability to hold the end of that stock. And again, the material might matter. Here, for example, this is tool steel. And while it is possible to part tool steel on a small lathe like this, I have demonstrated that on my channel, it is going to tend to chatter and it's a lot of hassle. So taking it to the bandsaw is a lot easier. But once again, that's going to affect your order of operations because now I need to face the back of this part, which means reinserting it into the chuck, which may or may not be an issue depending on the needs of this feature. I've talked a lot about concentricity here, but for order of operations, there's two types of concentricity to consider, axial concentricity and planar concentricity. In this case, I'm flipping the part end for end, and I've lost axial concentricity, but the only operation I need to do on this end is to face it, and for facing, all that matters is planar concentricity. In other words, whether the face that you're creating is parallel to faces at the opposite end of the part. That pretty rarely matters for cylindrical parts like this, so it's almost always safe to flip apart end for end and not worry about concentricity if all you're doing is facing. Of course, if you're facing, the only thing that happens if you don't have axial concentricity is your tool marks aren't running perfectly true. Another consideration is whether a feature is aesthetic or functional. In this case, I'm putting a chamfer on the back, but remember, I've lost my axial concentricity here, so this chamfer is technically going to be running out. Now, it's just an aesthetic feature, obviously, so that doesn't matter, but if this was like an alignment chamfer on a part, for example, where concentricity was important, then you'd want to consider that in your order of operations, and perhaps you wouldn't want to flip the part at the end, or you'd have to dial it in on a four jaw, or use a collet chuck, or other work holding that was able to hold concentricity. However, functional features come in different flavors as well. I need a set screw back here, so I'm going to center drill for that. But again, technically this set screw will not be concentric with the part, but it's just a set screw, so that doesn't matter. If this was, again, going to be a reamed alignment hole that was crucial to the functioning of the part, if it was a spinning shaft and a transmission or something, then this concentricity might be crucial, and you might have to choose a different order of operations for creating this hole. So, for example, you might need to start with this end of the part and turn down the OD to match it or something along those lines. 
Here on the lathe, I think it's also worth noting that features that go in the end of a part, such as a longitudinal hole, a thread on the end of a part, a shoulder, things like that, are frequently a crucial order of operations factor. Because having full access to the end of the part while it's spinning in a concentric setup is a limited time situation. You gotta do it when you can do it, so it's not unusual for all of your other decisions on the lathe to hinge around something that has to go in the end of the part. Right now, of course, I'm tapping the set screw into nothing. But this is another order of operations consideration. Anytime you've got two bores that need to meet, in this case the set screw hole and the cross hole for the Tommy bar, think about what order you want to make those features in. There are times when it's easier to make two holes meet up in the middle if you drill one first and then the other, or vice versa. In this case it actually doesn't matter, and so I'm doing the set screw now just because it's more convenient. So convenience is of course also a big order of operations decider. Dependencies between components is also an order of operations factor. Here I'm switching stock now to the 1144 because I'm going to make the Tommy bar next. Anytime you have two parts that need to fit together, think about the order you want to make those parts in and the order of features within those parts. For example, it's typically easier to match an OD to an ID than the other way around because IDs are generally set by drills and reamers and hole making tools whereas the OD you can dial it in with the turning tool to whatever you need. It's also easier to fine tune an OD because you can always use emery paper and other cheats if you have to. Here's another interesting center drill decision. I chose to put the center in it while it was choked up in the chuck there, and that's because I know I'm going to be turning down the OD of this part. However, you get better centers if you do them while the part is pulled out of the chuck because that will automatically compensate for any bend or other flaws in the material. So if you're not going to be turning the OD, you want to pull the part out and drill the center while the stock is pulled out. And if the stock is going to be too flimsy to do that, then you're going to want to set up the steady rest for that. However, if you're turning down the OD like I am here, it doesn't matter if the center is a little bit off because you're going to be reacquiring the concentricity by the turning in any case. Quick sidebar on a crucial order of operations decision that I don't really have a way to demonstrate here on this part because it's so simple and that's the risk of a feature. If you've got a feature that's especially risky, for example, on an elaborate casting, or you've got a specific dimension that's really critical and you're not sure if you're gonna be able to hit it, try to arrange it so that you do that feature as early as possible in the life of the part. That de-risks your time investment. If you screw up that feature and it was the first or second thing you did, eh, no time lost, get new material, try again. That one thing that you gotta nail the surface finish or the dimension on, on a complicated part, you don't want to be doing that right at the end, when the stakes are really high. When choosing your order of operations, think about which dimensions on the part are critical, because the setup and the order that you do features in can make it easier or more difficult to hit a particular dimension. In this case, for example, I'm turning the OD of this part all at once, which is very, very good for concentricity, if that was important, but less good for dimension, if that was important. With a long, flexible part like this, the center of it is guaranteed to be a couple of thou oversized because it's going to deflect in the middle as the cutter passes over it. So if it was really crucial that the diameter of this part be consistent all the way down, then that would affect the setup and possibly the order in which you do various features. You might have to use a steady rest or a follow rest or other similar setups. In my case, the important thing is that I want a little groove in the center of the Tommy bar to engage with the set screw and I need to leave room at the end to cut that center out of there because I don't want a center drill in the end of my Tommy bar. So this setup and this order of doing these cuts made the most sense because it allows me to get the length of the bar right and get this center groove centered around whatever is going to be left of the bar after I cut off the center. And of course I only have one shot at this because once I cut that center out, I can no longer set it up as you see here. Surface finish is another factor in order of operations. I want to choke this up now to cut that center off, and as you see I'm using aluminum shim stock there to protect the finished surface from the chuck jaws. However, if you're not able to do that, then you might want to do these operations in a different order so that the chuck jaws are only gripping on unfinished surfaces. For example, if you needed to cut a coarse thread on the end of this shaft with a die, that can be problematic when you're gripping the part like this because that aluminum shim stock makes for less of a good grip on the part and it's going to tend to slip under the force of the die. One more thing to think about in your order of operations. 
In this case, the order was dictated by the fact that I needed to be choked up on the chuck in order to gain the rigidity required to part off that steel, and I also needed access to the end here for filing the hemispherical ends on it. However, this order could be dictated by the tooling that you have. For me, the issue was I didn't want to lose that center drill until the very end. However, if you, for example, have a negative center or a female center for your tailstock, then you could round the ends first and do those other operations that I did later in the process. For my Tommy bar, I'm going to flip it end for end here and cut the remainder of that stock off and then once again add the hemisphere at this end. But again, I've made a concentricity and order of operations decision here. These hemispheres are just for aesthetics and comfort, but if the concentricity of them was important, then I might not want to flip the part and use a file as I did here. I might want to leave it in one setup and use a form tool to cut the hemisphere on the back side of the part, something like that. I've chosen now to go over to the mill and put the hole in the body of the chuck key here with my cross drilling fixture. Again, this was an order of operations decision between two parts. I wasn't concerned about hitting the exact dimension that my reamer is going to produce here in this chuck key, but if that was a concern, if this fit was really, really critical, then you might want to do this feature first before turning the Tommy bar. And once again, the tooling that you have access to is important here. Drilling cross holes in round parts can be a little bit tricky depending on how thick the part is and how many different ways you have to hold it with the tooling that you have. Drill noises, drill noises, drill noises, drill noises. When and how you drill cross holes is frequently a decider of order of operations. A good rule of thumb for cross holes is generally you drill them first or last. Drilling them first is frequently when it's easiest to hold on to the part, but drilling them last is frequently when it's easiest to get them in the right place. So those are two common factors there. One of the easiest ways to get holes in two different features to align is by match drilling. You simply clamp the parts together and drill the hole through both at the same time. However, if you're going to do that, you need to plan ahead because you need to arrange it so that you are ready to drill the hole in both parts at the same time. Deburring is something that occasionally affects order of operations, though I wouldn't say it's common. An occasional challenge with deburring is getting access to the edge that you need to deburr, for example, the backside of a small hole. So that may dictate how and when you do certain features because you know you're going to need to get a carbide blade in there or something. I'm ready for final assembly on this chuck key now, but how and when you're going to test fit parts together is frequently an important order of operations decision. If you've got crucial dimensions and you want to be able to test that against the mating part, then try to arrange your operations so that those parts are available on the bench like this without losing a setup in order to fit them together. Some food for thought here, don't be afraid to just get out the notebook and sketch out a plan for a tricky part or if there's anything you're unsure of. And remember that there's no one best way to do any part. Order of operations is like optimization in software. There's always another cycle to save, always another bite to shave. There's always someone who's got a better order than you do. So just do the best you can and you'll get better at it over time. Well, there's my chuck key. Let's give it a little test drive here and see if it works. One of the reasons I wanted it beefier than the stock one was because I learned from James's key that having a lot of mass in a chuck key is actually really nice. It gives it some inertia so that you can quickly spin the chuck jaws open and closed like that. And yep, it's a chuck key. But now for the most important test, does it apron? Oh yeah, that's good apron action right there. There's my new hotness and there's old and busted. I will not miss that old chuck key for even one second. I do not have enough money to buy the words to describe how much I hated that old Chuck key. So I'm very pleased to have a new one. I hope you learned a little something about order of operations. I realize I threw a lot of random facts and examples at you there, but it really is a topic where experience is the number one thing you need to really wrap your head around it. The more parts you make, the more you'll understand when and how to do things in a different order. Just keep working at it and you will get your head around it, I promise. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons who make all of this possible. If you're not a patron, now is a great time to sign up. Just saying, and I'll see you next time.